Ben Kerr from TU Delft in the Netherlands. We're joined by Martin Stutchy from McKinsey Centre for Business and Environment. I think we had a very exciting moment right now uh, in Europe and uh, globally. Europe uh, is just working on what the European Commission calls uh, a circular economy uh, package. Um, which um, could be, in fact, uh, quite a game changer. China is working uh, for the next five-year plan on a circular economy strategy. So there could be a moment, finally, where we are entering a race to the top, where countries, where regions are, in fact, discovering resource productivity, the ability to make less, uh, of, with less resources, more wealth, more economic output, where this could in fact be the next paradigm in which we are competing. We had the opportunity to uh, work on a report which is called Growth Within um, uh, Circular Economy Vision for a Competitive Europe and to present it also to parts of the European um, Commission. I'd like to share some of those findings. Um, it's <clears throat> In fact, very contested also when you talk about, uh, talk about this with economists, a very contested ground. What holds true that on the one hand, we are already living in an economy where as much as possible is uh, uh, recycled, reused, shared, uh, and that pushing that further, accelerating that process, in fact, would push us out of uh, an economic optimum at a moment where the European economy is already um, uh, suffering from very high resource costs or is uh, accelerating that transition towards a circular economy. In fact, uh, increasing resource productivity with that productivity, with that competitiveness and making us just a better uh, uh, environment for employment and creation. So when we worked on this, we came out with uh, a fairly bold answer. We said that by 2030, the European economy could be better off uh, by 900 billion euros um, and that uh, only as an effect of a circular economy and that on top of that uh, also the societal outcomes would be better in terms of uh, income to households that would be better by something like three thousand uh, dollars or euros per household um, and we would also be able to spend less time in congestion and we would be able to uh, reach our climate commitments the two degree climate commitments ahead of schedule so these are very big numbers and so I think we Oh, all of you um, an explanation. When we thought about how to tell that story, we had a number of different choices. We could have told it as a story of uh, environmental degradation, and everyone buys that story. We could have told it as a story of uh, uh, resource dependency, and Europe is resource dependent. Uh, we are importing uh, fossil fuels and uh, minerals every year worth um, 760 uh, billion euros. Um, so that's 50% more than the US are importing. So we are, by all practical standards, a very resource dependent continent. But we decided not to tell the story that way. We decided to tell it as a story of structural waste. And we decided to tell it um, looking at a couple of those sectors that are most efficient, most mature, most optimized. One of them is uh, driving, mobility. If you think about it, and there's the, this is the first chart, um, that uh, in Europe, currently a car is parked 92% of its time. 1.8% um, of the time it's looking for parking space, 1% of the uh, time it's sitting in congestion. A car typically has five seats, only 1.5 of them are typically used. Out of the energy, typically it's fossil fuel uh, energy that we put into cars, 80% of that energy is lost in translation, only 20% of that is translated into kinetic energy. And out of that again, only a twelfth uh, is actually used to move the person simply because the occupancy rate in cars, as I said, is so low. Or if you look at cities, cities arguably the most valuable treasure that we have, 50% of the space in city is in fact um, used up uh, by traffic space, by roads. Um, and by parking space. Um, and even during rush hour, only 10% of the roads are really covered by cars. Um, so I could go on and on. Um, I could tell the same story for the food sector, which is also very mature and optimized, where uh, more than a third of the food is lost, uh, or even half of the edible uh, mass of vegetable and fruit is actually um, used. 
and where less than 5% of the nutrients that we put on fields is actually reaching the human body. Or I could talk about housing, which again is a very mature sector. Uh, and here, uh, even during uh, working hours, only 40-45% of office space is really used. So I think you understand where I'm trying to get. There is massive structural waste still in our system, even uh, after many, many rounds of getting it more efficient on a product level. But as we rise up to a system level, mobility, housing, uh, nutrition, there is a lot of structural waste still in the system. And if we look at, um, for, the, uh, for Europe overall, um, uh, all the products that we are using that we are producing they have a lifetime of uh, uh, nine years and that's everything from a plastic bottle towards an airbus without houses nine years and after those nine years 95 percent of that value that sits in those products is lost uh, so uh, we are only getting four to five percent of that value back and out of that value again uh, during the life cycle, during the nine years, we typically have, and I alluded to that a minute ago, uh, on a utilization of about 50%. So there is also, if you look at it from those macro numbers, numbers massive waste uh, in the system. And that also was the first finding, the first statement that we came back with from our report. Um, the second thing that we found and that uh, we are very strong about is that we are on the verge of a technology and a business model revolution that allows us to uh, massively reduce uh, the costs uh, of those services like mobility, like <coughs> food, like, uh, like housing. We have seen this many times in the past when it came to more um, digital uh, industries or so more service-driven industries like retail banking, like um, entertainment, um, like media uh, more broadly. Uh, but what we are seeing now is that the physical sectors and the physical industries are taken uh, upside down. And as, um, and as they're experiencing that, um, uh, the costs to the user are massively decreasing. We believe that uh, in mobility, for example, until 2030, we'll be able to bring uh, uh, the costs down by something like 30 to 40 percent and uh, by 2050 by 80 percent, not by producing the more efficient car, that's important, but by creating a new system of mobility, autonomous, uh, connected, shared, uh, electrified and uh, build in such a way that it can go back into the loop. And that's also what we show on the third slide, where we have run exactly that analysis for different industries. And we think that there is an enormous opportunity in mobility, in food and the built environment uh, to bring the cost to the users down. And the levers that are helping us to do that are uh, six of them. We call it the Resolve Framework. It's through regeneration by bringing back things back into uh, biosystems and making those biosystems more productive by sharing, which is a big deal, particularly in, uh, in mobility, as you all know, growing up in the Uber age, through optimizing, getting more yield out of resources, by looping, by virtualizing, so by killing transportation events in the first place, and by exchanging, by taking modern, advanced materials or products in the place of harmful ones that we have been using in the past. All of these, these things are viable now. There would have been dreams five or ten years ago. They're quite viable now. Uh, we have smartphones that allow us uh, to enable this, uh, uh, this new digital economy. We have new materials. We have the Internet of Things, which is allowing us to track uh, products beyond the first life cycle. Um, and uh, the indication that these possibilities are real now um, are evident because companies are actually grasping those six opportunities. They are starting to build the circular economy and uh, uh, the companies like uh, Airbnb or like P-Rex or like uh, uh, Patagonia or like um, Caterpillar, uh, like Zalando that we are showing on the fourth slide are in fact amongst the fastest growing that we as McKinsey are aware of. That's our second finding. The third one is that we won't get there automatically and technology won't get us to those benefits alone. Um, we um, need to introduce a couple of new principles that we didn't have in the past but we need them. One principle is around how we're treating finite resources. 
One principle is around how we are optimizing yield out of those resources that we put into operation. And one principle is about how we are avoiding uh, negative system effects and externalities into other systems. Um, if you apply them, uh, and we have done that in our work, it gives you a surprisingly concrete guidance, and that takes me to page number, uh, number six. Surprisingly concrete guidance on how to build the systems of the future. Not to build a system of the supercar, but to build this new intermodal system well embedded into uh, the mobility system of a city that uh, tells us not just to go for precision farming and to be a bit more efficient in agriculture, but really to close the loop, to bring nutrients back and to make we are uh, investing into quality food. And the same thing goes for housing. So we were able to build very, very concrete um, scenarios around a world that would happen if we just go with technology or if we mix technology with circular principles and that's what we called our circular future and now taking all of that together and that's page uh, seven in the slides uh, uh, we were able to calculate and to model and to estimate of course what the economic implications of building a world that's just uh, uh, business as usual, usual technology improvement or a world uh, that is really built around using and harnessing that technology for a circular future. Uh, and here we come back to our uh, major findings. We think that out of the total cost that we are occurring as uh, the users in Europe of mobility, of food, uh, of housing, uh, could come down by something like 25%, 1.8 trillion, and that's 900 billion more than we would get if we just went for technology only. So you're recognizing these numbers that I mentioned in the, in the past uh, when I uh, moved into this uh, presentation. Um, now again, we went one step further and we said, look, if these scenarios are real, uh, what would it do to the economy? And so we used a large uh, a general equilibrium model um, with all the input-output relationships and for 27 European countries. And we um, uh, put the scenarios um, with all their material uh, implications into it. Um, and um, the results we were getting is that it will have a positive effect on households' uh, available uh, income. It will have a positive effect on GDP until 2030, we think we will have 11 percentage points more uh, uh, disposable household income if we go for a more shared, more connected, a more uh, dematerialized, more looped um, uh, resource productive future applying circular economy principles. And we think that we will have 7 percentage points more uh, GDP. Uh, that's a big deal, if you think about it. That's uh, uh, over the next year, something like half a percentage point more in growth. And just to remind ourselves, that was about the promise that uh, the grand project of the European internal market was promising us. So if you want the building a circular economy and making resource productivity uh, a central pillar of our future competitiveness strategy um, as a union, is in fact a political project as massive, as uh, promising as the internal market has been. Well, and then it is also a way to deliver on our uh, uh, climate change commitments and uh, to make ourselves much more independent from uh, resources. Um, uh, on page nine, we are showing the numbers of uh, how it could be a significant uh, reduction in CO2 emissions already by 2030 and much more significant by 2015. So we could go to 52% of two days emission by 2030. So that's uh, uh, only half of the 2012 emissions, um, uh, much more than technology only uh, would give us. And with those numbers, we would be back on track. Uh, we would be back on track with regard to 2 degrees centigrade uh, and to the commitments that we have politically made and that will be discussed uh, in Paris uh, end of this year 2015. Um, so uh, in a way we find that the whole story around circularity is not just an economic promise, it is also um, 
if you want, the forgotten vector in a lot of the climate discussions um, because it goes all the way back to the root causes of why we are emitting so much, uh, which is the massive amount of resources that we are using uh, in order to uh, create wealth. And by going deeper and using the six resolve levers, um, we would be much closer to the root cause of our climate and our environmental challenge. Let me pause here and uh, hand over to the faculty for questions. Yes, thank you, Martin. That's fantastic. And uh, you've gone through quite comprehensively. But if I may, I'd, I'd like to sort of ask a few questions and go a little bit deeper. I'm looking at this, uh, this fantastic resolve framework that you've developed. Do you, would you argue that's sort of one of the core things of the of your growth within approach? We are quite excited about it for two reasons. First of all, it feels complete. Um, so uh, we couldn't think of anything, any lever um, that's not in it. Uh, you very often have also when you uh, uh, hit the ground in the reality of companies, which we do a lot given our profession, uh, that there is a trade-off between the short-term efficiencies and uh, long-term redesign. And I think uh, by running down the six levers you capture uh, all of that. Uh, and it forces you to think very fundamentally, not just about uh, the way you're operating, but also about the product and also about the business model. And I think it's particularly by rethinking the business model that a lot of the environmental and resource productivity opportunities are captured. Um, there is a lot of fatigue and uh, uh, also disappointment with how green products have been picked up by markets. Uh, that is different if you uh, change your business model altogether. If you stop selling um, tires, if you sell kilometers, if you stop selling fridges but sell freshness, or if you stop selling uh, mobile phones, you sell connectivity. All of a sudden you have created a very strong incentive for your user and for yourself as a producer uh, to become much more resource productive, to make sure once you are getting uh, the products back, you can refurbish them, or to make sure that uh, uh, the customer is using light, for example, if you don't sell lamps, if you sell um, looks, uh, in an efficient way. So uh, I think there is a huge case for incentive alignment and uh, as you think about the business model and, uh, and the Resolve framework is helping to, uh, to systematically tick off all those levers available. Um, the second thing is we've tested it, we are using it a lot with our clients and they like it and they get it and that uh, that's, that's, uh, um, speaks uh, in favor of it. That's, that's good news and, and that's really important because that is an acid test. In, in this MOOC we've, we've picked up on a number of circular knowledge themes and some of the thinkers from the past and present as well. Did you pick up on some of those when you were developing growth within? Yeah, clearly. I mean, if you want, uh, the, the whole thinking around circular economy is eclectic in a, in a good way because it's uh, picking up thinking that has been around uh, but uh, that perhaps hasn't been pulled together sufficiently, that hasn't been framed strongly enough. Uh, uh, so uh, that it actually has not translated into a new operating mode in the way we run companies and eventually our economy. Uh, there is uh, the whole story around uh, industrial ecology which uh, essentially um, pursues that uh, both energy and, uh, and resource streams are uh, fed back into the uh, into the system uh, so by also by co-locating uh, industrial plants etc there's the whole uh, the whole story of cradle to cradle which Michael Browngard and Bill McDonough have been spearheading for so many years um, th there's the whole story around uh, the performance economy that Walter Stahel has been pushing uh, so there is a there's a lot of thinking that went into it there is a lot of thinking around from economists uh, like uh, Robert Ayres and the uh, um, and uh, Exegy sort of who was making a point that uh, resources are much more important as an, uh, as an input into the economy than current gr growth models imply. 
But there's also very fundamentally, of course, a lot of biological science that goes into it. And there is a lot of uh, physics uh, in a way. The circular economy is the populist and economic attempt to reframe um, the laws of, particularly the second law of thermodynamics. That's, that's very good and, and helpful and we, we certainly applaud a lot of those uh, thinkers that you've mentioned there and we recognize them in the course. I just want to come on to uh, there was slide seven there and, and there you mentioned the current development scenario and a circular economy scenario and we have this term rebound effect and we know from traditional, more traditional sustainability approaches that rebound effects have often had disastrous consequences and undone a lot of things. And here you show, under the current development scenario, a certain figure for a rebound effect, a lower figure for a circular economy scenario. Can you say anything about why that is less in a circular economy scenario? I think it's two reasons. The one is very practical and the other one is a bit more philosophical. Um, the, the, the practical one is uh, that under a circular economy scenario we are assuming uh, a couple of rules to be in place that are limiting uh, rebound effects. Uh, so uh, uh, it's, it's clear that with those uh, cost improvements that we talked about uh, you will, we will see an elastic demand response and so rebound ef uh, effect will happen. Uh, so if you for example allow um, <coughs> um, without any uh, increase in marginal cost to the user as many cars into a city as in the past then of course you should uh, 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 then you should expect that the, the cheaper mobility in autonomous driving or in, uh, uh, in electrified driving uh, will then in fact also uh, translate into a higher passenger miles traveled. Um, so uh, we need to have something like a congestion fee, for example, to make sure this is not happening. Um, the report, by the way, talks about the positive uh, economic and social effects on of these uh, instruments like a congestion fee and it's uh, quite remarkable how positive it is and why it's not picked up everywhere. Um, so that's the practical aspect. The more philosophical aspect is of course that once you have lower material intensities, higher resource productivities, you're operating uh, in a more dematerialized and regenerative system, then even more use of course uh, is against uh, a more benign multiplier um, of uh, resources used. And so uh, you would expect that to go down um, versus uh, an efficiency scenario. So the first uh, scenario, current development pass, is a lot driven by efficiencies. Um, the second one is more driven uh, sort of by uh, the, the holistic uh, the dematerialization of the economy. And that's why you're operating against a, a more benign multiplier. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And I, I was interested there that you were touching on that it's looking like we're going to need a more sophisticated dialogue with stakeholders to ensure that we avoid negative outcomes as we transition to a circular economy. And I think that's important. I also, you, you talked about, and then there you have on one of your on slides four, you talk about these companies starting to move. And one of the things that I often get asked by all sorts of folks is, is this really happening? Is, are we really seeing companies seriously engaging with this dialogue? What's your view? Yeah, you're right. I, I think uh, sometimes uh, we see things that we want to see and so we, we declare them a reality. Um, at the same time, I think this is uh, a lot of this is real. I mean, the share economy, there's no doubt uh, that uh, we didn't have a very sophisticated one a few years ago. Now we have one. It's growing massively. Airbnb is the uh, single biggest accommodation, uh, if you want, provider. Uh, Uber is one of the la is probably the largest uh, uh, ground uh, passenger transport company. So uh, this is as real as it can um, can be. I think it's also real that uh, a couple of very large companies um, are trying to see where this actually can be part of their uh, corporate strategy. Uh, if you look at the large uh, environmental services companies, they're making a very strong and I think credible push 
to be more than just uh, the, the waste haulers, but to be a partner to industry, um, to uh, help them manage their um, material cycles in the future. Um, and they see that as, a, as an opportunity to have a very uh, steady um, and, uh, and, and high margin uh, service driven business. Um, if you look at uh, uh, a couple of uh, uh, equipment manufacturers, they are absolutely serious about moving from product to service. Um, there is this whole idea of selling lux rather than lamps and selling uh, kilometers rather than tires is a huge strategic theme, even in the absence of any uh, circular economy philosophy sort of uh, companies do that for reasons of customer retention for reasons of uh, 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 share of wallet uh, so this is a uh, absolutely real um, and the same thing also goes uh, I think for uh, for, for uh, parts of industry where in the past you could uh, you would have um, concluded that, for example, an effort around food, food waste sort of was very much uh, a reactive stance, a way to demonstrate good responsibility. I think the way companies also in the food, in this food sector are thinking about this is now much more fundamental and deep, and they are trying to see this as a, as a source of, uh, a, as, a, as a very strategic challenge, but also potentially as a source of value. And, uh, and all of these things are real, sort of, it's also clear, however, that the circular economy as such continues to be uh, a niche uh, within uh, a mainstream model that is still very resource intensive, but it's outgrowing the mainstream by far and that is very uh, reconfirming and encouraging. Indeed it is. And I'm, I'm going to ask you one last question and, and I'll just make an observation. You, you began today by talking about the important lead we see from the European Union and we all eagerly await the circular economy package. Uh, we're starting to see some uh, early press releases from them outlining what they want to do and it looks quite exciting. But on, for the average European citizen, uh, what, what do you think they will notice if, if the CE circular economy vision that you're talking about becomes a reality? I think they, uh, some of that is of course behind the curtain, it's uh, related to how we are running supply chains, logistic chains, companies. Uh, but I think there's a lot that will, hopefully, of course I haven't seen it either, sort of uh, make the, uh, the light of day of, uh, of consumer perception. Um, uh, one thing would be around uh, plastic packaging, for example. I think there's a very strong notion that we need to rethink the way we are uh, uh, using um, plastic packaging in the future. Uh, currently, uh, it continues to be there's a, this. Uh, uh, essentially, all the value is lost during the first use cycle, and we are uh, not uh, valorizing it in a, in a way that we technologically could. Um, and uh, uh, I think this is something which sort of goes very deep into everyday habits, and that's something that uh, uh, consumers will see. Again, depending on what kind of rules we are and what kind of market we are creating for ourselves in, in Europe. And this is perhaps a, also um, a very important note to, to end on. Um, uh, this is uh, probably more than a discussion of how many additional rules we want to uh, uh, impose onto ourselves. Um, I think it's more a discussion of what kind of markets we want to create. I mean, all markets are uh, essentially a human creation and they are defined uh, in order to work well for the kind of uh, economic and societal purpose we are giving that market. And the whole discussion here is just another one of those. Uh, what uh, do markets or what kind of markets um, do we want to work for us? And the way you can um, regulate any other market in the financial industry, in, uh, uh, in the transport industry, in the automotive industry, uh, there's also a market for resources and secondary resources which we can regulate in such a way that it works well for us and that it drives what we are looking for in Europe, uh, which is uh, competitiveness, which is uh, growth, which is employment and which is innovation. And I really think these rules that we were trying uh, to describe in the report um, 
could be uh, a good guidance uh, for well-organized and well-regulated and highly beneficial markets uh, that work for us in the future. Martin, thank you very much for uh, giving us uh, your insights today. It's been fantastic. And uh, we thank you uh, for all your help. Thank you for your interest and for your patience. Let's connect soon.